right. Welcome to the Dad the Best I Can podcast. Today we are lucky to be joined by DC Crenshaw. DC is a husband. He is a entrepreneur in the food and lifestyle space. And of course, DC is a dad. How's it going today, DC? I'm good. How you doing, Rob? I'm doing well. Where are you calling in from? Chicago, Chi Town. All right. Warming up there finally. Everything's getting uh everything is hot these days. Yeah, 80 degrees, man. You know, we we uh, accept that weather any day of the week. Yeah. So, DC, I, I we've had you on the podcast before talking dad life, talking football, all those things. But I saw a post you made on Instagram that I really haven't seen a lot of people talk about. And that was kind of what made me want to reach out to you so you could share. Why don't you just tell us about your post, your story back in college, playing college football? Yeah, you know, uh, well, when I got to college, obviously everyone is, um, you know, I, I'm there playing football, but uh, you meet a, a bunch of different people from other uh, walks of life, other cities, other backgrounds, uh, especially in my dorm. So, you know, in my dorm on the boys uh, on the boys' floor, the men's floor, two doors down there were uh, a couple of white swimmers, and um, they had never really been uh exposed to a lot of black people before they were from the suburbs of michigan and um you know i come to come to find this out later but you know um and uh so they had really never interacted with black people before what they knew of black people was what they saw on the news and what they saw by watching tv um and you know over the semester we became friends and we would hang out in each other's rooms and, and talk and and just, you know, kind of chill out and all that stuff. Um, but one night I was in their room and we were having some uh, discussions and they, you know, they were, uh, I guess they felt comfortable enough to start asking me about me being a black, black guy. And they were just asking me all these questions and, you know, something that I, I didn't even put on my post in, uh, on Facebook, the one that you saw, or Instagram, was it kind of started out by saying, you know, DC, when we see you, or or we see black people as this, we see black people as the N word, and we see black people. So it was like there was the N word, and then there's black people. I don't see you as an N word, right? And so. And uh, and so, uh, you know, they were being honest and I had to explain, educate and say, hey, you know, just because you see someone that may not articulate like I do or may not come from a background where, you know, that is, um, um, you know, in the hood or, or um, you know, more uh, middle class or something like that, you, I mean, you can't judge them because of that and no one is that and so we started talking about that and then they had some other questions and, and then one of them was like you know you know dc um can i ask you a question and i was like yeah he was like is your blood the same color as mine and i was like uh yeah it is <laughs> and his other roommate was like of course it is but he really didn't know either to be mm -hmm. honest with you because he was kind of looking like yeah of course it is right and um, and so, you know, it was one of those moments where, you know, um, I didn't get I didn't get upset or anything like that, even though they were it was just for me how ignorant they were. Um, it, obviously, it came from a place of not being exposed, the parents maybe not being exposed, um, only believing what you see on TV and, uh, you know, just living up to these stereotypes or, or believing these stereotypes that were often cast on us, even back in what the early eighties. Right. So, um, you know, and I tell that, I, I told that story, you know, on and off every now and then. Um, and, uh, you know, I told that stories to my, my, my uh, two boys and they couldn't believe it. They started laughing. What? <laughs> he thought you had different colored blood and he was trying to explain me what blood looks like and our blood is blue and the, uh, in your veins and they come out red. And so, um, but a lot of people resonated with what I said and I had a lot of people reach out to me 
some of them with their own stories. Um, actually, some of my Jewish friends, one of my Jewish buddies I actually just met with today was telling me when he was in college at Illinois State, a lot of people had never interacted with Jewish people before, and they were looking for his horns uh, on his head. And they were asking him if his skin was green. Um, and so, you know, it's not necessarily exclusive to black people. Um, it's, it, it happens where people are, un, are uneducated and they, um, you know, and they hear, hear stories that are passed down from, you know, from their family or from their people that they're close to because that's where it comes from. If you're in your 20s, and you're, and if you're in your teens, your 20s or, or whatever, and you, and you don't know these things, um, you know, th those are, those are things that someone down the, uh, uh pre previously, uh, you know, previous that, that they interacted with failed to, to share with them or just failed to do their research. And these are beliefs that get passed down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think what you said is whether it's ignorance, first of all, I guess props to them for feeling comfortable enough with you to ask that question and for you to have the patience to listen. But I do think that's a big thing as we, you know, we all say we're all the same and we all get along, but I'm sure most people, a lot of people don't have as many black friends as maybe they, they claim and they're on social media posting. And I think, I mean, I don't know the impact that it had on those guys in college, but just really connecting and asking you those questions, I think really kind of diffuses a lot of the differences and they get to know you as a person versus just somebody you see on TV or something. So, well, you know, you know, see now um, people are everywhere with social media and and um, and uh, you know obviously TV, but people on social media all the time. We see things on our phones. We we're always connected to our phones, so we see things. We see tweets, we see Facebook posts, and all that stuff. I think you know back then the media was really powerful. Back then, it's still powerful, but you know if you're if if TV is only putting out certain things about people um, at 11 o'clock on the news. Um, and if you only or you're, if you're not able to see any positive people um, on TV that uh, that are black or, you know, or, or uh, another person of color, and all you see is something that is negative and, and derogatory and um, you see people that are killing or stealing or, or, or things like that, I can see how that has shaped their, their minds. And being in a bubble, you know, in the suburbs doesn't help. And I think people are comfortable in their communities and they don't want to leave their communities because they're happy, you know, they're, they're comfortable. Um, and when they see something on TV that's a problem, they go, oh, um, you know, they may feel empathy, but they they go back to their regular lives and they really can't they can't relate, mm -hmm. right? And so, um, and I'm not saying that I relate to everything, because I can't relate to a lot of these these um, black people that are living in poverty or or living in conditions that are just you know they're just crazy ridiculous. Uh, but I can relate to their struggle. Uh, you know, every day. So every day I step outside my door, I know, you know, that um, I have to be different. I know that I can't, uh, you know, I, I, I can't make certain mistakes, um, even in business, even in athletics. You can't make certain mistakes because you may not ever get another opportunity. Mm-hmm. And what you're saying, too, about the news is this isn't everybody just likes to pit Fox News up against CNN. But I talked to somebody earlier today who's in media and he's like, don't be fooled. CNN just wants clicks and viewers, too. And as much as a nice, peaceful protest is probably what's going on 90 percent of the world, what they are incentivized to show are the looting, the rioting. And then, like you said, if you're just exposed to that by watching TV or hearing from your parents, uh, that is kind of, you're going to be like, well, I know we're all alike, but I don't, it's, it can be confusing for sure. And I think that's where us as dads are learning that we kind of have to cut through that. Absolutely. I mean, you, you hit the nail on the head with that. You know, 
media is powerful. I try to watch Fox News and the other news, you know, MSNBC, and because I want to hear what both sides are saying. And um, and I have issues with both sides, you know. First of all, just tell the truth, right? And but the, there's been times where both sides have manipulated words to make it sound worse than what the person was actually saying. Just say exactly what is happening. Don't try to, um, you know, in, insert your own hyperbole to get viewers. Um, you know, just report the news as it is, and don't don't lie, don't twist. You know, and unfortunately, this is the world we're living in now, especially in media, where everyone wants, you know, they want eyeballs on uh, on what they're reporting, and they're pandering to the people that are watching them, and. Uh, um, so both sides are guilty, but, you know, it comes down to, you know, who's being more truthful, um, you know, with their reporting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's something that, you know, I don't, I think most of us, the wool kind of is pulled over our eyes and I am, I think I'm finally starting to accept that they're not going to change. They're not going to tell the truth, if you will. So it's like on us to realize that you're only seeing this through a filter and, you know, explaining that to our kids, like waiting for them to tell the story. I mean, in reality, that's just not as sensationalized or exciting. So I think exactly. part of that is just taking the media, your side and the other side with a real grain of salt. And that's hard for us to do. So I can't imagine how tough it is for our kids and especially when they're being influenced by their friends who are influenced by their parents. So yeah, right. it, it is a massive learning experience for all of us. Mm -hmm. So talk about, uh, how did over the past week or two, and I know I've talked to a lot of people, this is not new story. It just, we're filming it a lot more. Right. What was the conversation like with you and your boys? How old are they now? Uh, my oldest is almost 12 and my youngest is eight. Um, so, so, you know, we talk about, we talk about race all the time. We talk about, and, and, and we, what we talk about, you know, from the time they could start understanding is, as who they are as black people, right? As, as black little boys. As, uh, um, and it's, it's, it was hard for, for them to understand that, you know, they were, they were black boys. We had to have that conversation that you're, you're an African-American and, um, you know, it, it happened, you know, I think one day we were, uh, uh, we, we were chatting about something and, and oh, my son, here you go. My son was in uh, my youngest, my, I mean, my oldest was in preschool. And uh, he went to a preschool where he think he was the only black kid in his class, right? Um, so all his friends were writing. And, um, and so one day we picked him up from school and he said, I, I, I don't like the color of my skin. He was like, I want my skin to be lighter. And we're like, we, what are you talking about? Why? And he said, because all my friends have lighter skin, I want to be like them. And, uh, and my wife is biracial, you know, her mother's white. And so he's like, you know, mommy's lighter too. I want to, and I had to, we had to explain to him, look, you, your skin is beautiful. And this is why. And, you know, and so, you know, we have those conversations, you know, from a young age. And then we start, you know, things happen in the news and they ask questions because we're, you know, I'm a news junkie, so I have the news on all the time, and they ask questions. And so, you know, when it comes to racism and what they see with George Floyd, kids just have simple questions. Why are they doing that, Dad? You know, why, why are people hate you from the, why would they not like you because you're, because you have black skin? And they can't comprehend it. I was like, you know, he, and they was, they say it's stupid. And I was like, you're absolutely right. It's stupid. And I, you know, and I, and I tell them, I said, look, you have good, you got more good people in this world than bad people. But, and we talk about, you know, the, the 60s. We talked about the civil rights movement. They know about Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King. They know all about that movement. And so I take them through the history. And I, you know, I, and a matter of fact, the other day, yesterday, I said, can you imagine not being able to drink out of the same water fountain as your friends? And I said, can you imagine that you would have to sit in the back of the bus um, if you, you know, if you were riding a bus? Uh, I said, can you imagine not being able to go to school with your friends? And so, you know, 
we, we, you know, we talk about why people do what they do and why there is racism and where it stems from, you know, back in slavery time, you know, when they brought us, when they brought the slaves over here, nothing was intended, all they intended for us to be our slaves. Um, and, but over time, obviously things got better and things got better, but then you have people that still don't want you, that don't think you're worthy and don't want you to, um, have the same privilege that they do. And so, you know, we, we, we talk to our kids, try to be honest, honest with them and as simple as possible, as far as explaining it. But kids are, you know, kids are, are innocent and we don't want to taint them with something that will affect them where they just think all white people are bad. Because my, one of my sons said something general one time and um, he said something like, they probably did it because we were black. And I was like, no, no, that's not it. Don't don't say that just because you know you you have to you have to look at each situation differently. Or he says something he says something like, "Well, they probably um, he probably doesn't like it because he like us because he's white." And I said, "No, true. That's not that's not it." So it's all about communication, but it's also about making sure that you don't generalize. You know, just like you know, I hate when people go, "Well, all black people don't don't rob and loot." Well, that, as we need all black people. No, most black people don't do that. You know, it's, it's, and, and it's, it's, it's just like saying black people, well, not all white people are racist. Well, most white people aren't racist. You know, you say some people, Robin Luke, some people are racist, you know? And so, you know, when we're talking to them, we try to bring up examples because I think uh, kids, but my kids love my stories that I, that I tell, you know, from, from college, from high school, from growing up, and they're always asking me to tell a story. And so I, uh, I try to educate them through my experiences um, and uh, allowing them to kind of paint the picture in their head of, of what, uh, of, uh, of, you know, what, 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 what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, like I said, we, we are, um, we, we've always been open and honest uh, they have white, they have a white grandmother, they have uh, white aunts, cousins and uncles, uh, white grandfathers, um, and, uh, you know, a half white mom. And, but, you know, kids, kids play with each other, not thinking about what color they are. You know, kids just want to have a good time. They just want to, want you to play basketball with them or football or soccer or frisbee or, they don't care. Mm -hmm. We teach our kids about racism. Sometimes we have to point it out, you know, because if they're getting treated, you know, less than or someone is doing something, we have to point it out. People say they don't see color. You have to see color because you have to, you have to explain the differences to, to, to your kids about, you know, if they have a question, eventually they're going to have a question, right. you know, um, they can have a question about a religion. My kids have questions about, they had questions about um, Muslim uh, people. They have questions about Jewish people. And, uh, you know, we don't know everything, but we try to answer, answer them the best way we can. Yeah. I mean, th I think a lot of it stems from our discomfort and confusion too. And like that whole line of we are all the same or their skin color, or there's, you know, those kind of things are, especially to a kid who's just thinking they don't have these built in biases. They're like, well, what are you talking about? And right. so I think maybe it is just us getting more comfortable with that discussion and being open about it and maybe showing that we're vulnerable too. But yeah, I appreciate hearing that. So I know you, you are friends with a lot of other dads, black and white. What kind of things have, have you guys been talking about or have you been talking about, how to discuss it with, with the, their kids? So, you know, uh, you know, I talk to we, my, my, my black friends, we talk all the time about, you know, just things that are happening in the country, especially with Donald Trump. Um, and some of the things that he said, um, that, you know, that in my opinion have been, um, downgrading black people and downgrading 
black athletes and stuff like that. So we always have discussions from my black friends. I mean, this is all, you know, we, we do this. That's what we do. But lately I've, I've been getting uh, calls from at least a dozen of my white friends. Uh, most of them white male friends I play ball with. And um, they literally just reached out to say, look, man, I'm sorry what's happening. I, I want I, I want to help. I don't know how to help. You know, you're just a, you're a friend. Um, and I appreciate you. I love you. And, uh, and you know, what, what can I do? I'm having conversations with my, uh, they're telling me I'm having conversations with my kids. You know, some of them are, are teen or teenagers. Some of them are in college. Some of them are in high school. Some are just young, but you know, and I, I can't tell them what to say to their kids, right? They, they have to figure that out them, themselves. But what's most important is that they're reaching out and they're telling me that they're, they just want to listen and learn and understand more because the consistent message I got from them was, I thought I knew a lot, but I don't know anything. Mm -hmm. I, I, I need to learn more. I need to understand more. Um, and, you know, I think the, the best thing that white people, especially my white friends can do for me is to let us know you stand with us. You know, um, it doesn't have to be a rah-rah. You don't have to be on the streets protesting. But, you know, somehow, you know, people are quick to post something on social media, right? You know, I see your, I see, I, we see you. I, I see who's for us, who's against us. I see, I see people that are saying something and people that are saying nothing. And you are uh, causing more harm when you say nothing. You know, if you don't believe that, you know, Black Lives Matter or I should be created, I should be treated as equal as you, then that tells me who you are. So, you know, we don't necessarily need to be friends, but it's not, now it's not the time to try not to offend someone, mm -hmm. right? I think now is the time to, I don't care about, you know, your brand, um, care about any, you know, it's, it's about saving lives. It's about you know, people that are getting killed have been getting killed for so many, so, so, uh, so long. And, uh, you know, you gotta, you, you, some, you need, we need to hear you. We need to see you. And, uh, and, you know, I, I've seen, I've, I was blown away by people posting the blackout on their, on their social media page. I saw you did it. And I saw a lot of other people that are doing it and all I can, you know, they just, I really just wanted to, to you know, cry because, you know, that made me feel like you were with us. You're with me, you know, you're standing beside me and you're not going to tolerate me being treated less than. And it, because I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't stand there and let someone treat you less than, you know, my, my friends, I, I just wouldn't do it. This is not how I was raised. And I think most black people, because we've been discriminated against, will feel the same. We don't like to see other races and other religions getting um, uh, discriminated against. You know, I mean, when we see people killing, uh, blowing up synagogues and making anti-Semitic remarks, we, we, we get pissed too. Um, you know, when we see, you know, our Latino brothers and sisters um, being targeted for something, I mean, we get, we get pissed. We Asians, you know, Muslims. The thing is, is that, you know, if, if, if everyone, was I guess you could say less selfish, um, and you know just didn't uh, sweep things under the rug or or try to blow it off when something goes uh, happens. Um, I think we can, you know, really stop this from what I'm seeing right now. So I, I appreciate hearing that because that was something I was hesitant, and I saw all the people posting the black squares and. As a white guy, I'm like, is it, obviously I'm on your side, but when I was doing it even, I felt like, is this kind of just virtue signaling? Look at me. But, you know, I did it. And then seeing all of them and then like feeling that kind of support. And then I heard a video talking about why it is important to do anything to speak out a little yep. made me feel better about it. Because for one, I, I didn't even think that you could take silence as 
maybe they are, you know, maybe I got to wonder about this person and that, you well, know, I guess your reaction to your friends calling you, even if it's awkward and a little corny and look, I don't know what to say, but that means a lot to you. So that's, that's helpful to hear because I think that's part of the divide too, is like, uh, we'll stay out of this. We're, we're white guys. We don't really know. You know, we don't know what you're going through, so we shouldn't speak out. But you're saying, see, that, and and that's great that you're saying that because I I know that white people have that, you know, feeling like you know this is um, this isn't really our problem. We're gonna let them handle it, but we can't handle it without you guys, because you know if we have you when I mean, we can we we can do only do so much so much right. If we have our white brothers and sisters walking beside us and with us and people are seeing that people are getting now now people are getting more comfortable i can do this you know and then people that have their racist friends you know if you check them and if they say something racist or if they do something that's racist you know that can be an uncomfortable situation for anybody right mm -hmm. um but you have to check them you know you you have to you, i mean that's where it starts because if you don't say anything, I mean, they, they're, going to, they're going to continue to do it. I have a, a Indian friend of mine who reached out to me and, you know, she told me about the Indian culture and how the Indian culture is racist towards blacks and how she's heard some racist comments from her friends and, um, and she never said anything, but now she's not, you know? And so just, just things like that. I mean, those, those are conversations that are uncomfortable, but you can't move forward unless you face those. Right. So. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. I appreciate hearing that. So what, has there been any other from your kids? Like how, how are they handling all this? Are they, I mean, I know Corona has people still kind of indoors, but we're starting to get out and about, are they coming to you to talk to this kind of thing? What kind of advice or how have you been dealing with that with them? Yeah. So, you know, we, uh, we try to, uh, just monitor, you know, what they see and what they watch often. Mm -hmm. But um, my youngest was uh, a little scared the other night when he saw all the, the looting and the protesting and not the protesting, the looting and rioting. He was scared and he's like, I don't want to watch this anymore. I'm scared. And so we were like, okay, you know, you mm -hmm. want to go in the back and watch TV. Um, so, you know, that part of it, they were pretty, uh, he was pretty, um, kind of shook it up about, because he just don't understand. You see these people burning and busting windows and think they're coming here. Um, but for the most part, you know, they ask good questions about, you know, they know what happened with George Floyd, because I asked them, I said, well, do you really know what happened? And they explained it to me. And I was like, okay. Um, and, uh, you know, we have a, a, um, a heavy influence on what we talk to our kids and how, how, you know, what they know and what they learn and all that. And we're just trying to do the right thing by staying honest and um, making sure that they know the truth. Try not to sugarcoat things too much, but, um, and help them understand that they're, they're safe. They're loved. They're safe. We're here for them. Um, you know, there's some things that they may experience in their lifetime that, you know, they may face that I faced because they're black. Um, and, you know, but at the end of the day, you know, we just try to give them as much hope as that, as they can. They're, they have hopes and dreams. And they ask us all the time, you know, daddy, can I be anything I want? So you can be anything you want, you know? I'm not going to tell you can't be, you know, you can be anything you want except, you know, this, this, and this. But my job is to prepare them right now as they're growing up so that when they go into the world, they're going to be able to face and handle whatever's going to come at them. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, I mean, we know, hopefully, I'm sure things will be a lot different for them. But I know that it's, it's a lot different. It was a lot different for me as a black man, just coming out and trying to, you know, do my thing and be successful, um, you know, just because of the color of my skin. And, you know, and I, and I think that a lot of, I think a lot of white people don't believe that, you know, and 
they, I think a lot of white people thought that, well, if you work hard and you do this and you do that, then this is going to result. Those things are true. But you also have, and there's also some other elements to it, right? I remember when I was in corporate America working um, for a pharmaceutical company and I had aspirations of moving up. I wanted to be, you know, a director. I wanted to be a vice president, you know, whatever. And um, and my, uh, I had a meeting with my my boss, and and she said, I told her, I told her, I said, you know, I want to, I want to do this. We said, what are your goals? I want to do this. And she was like, well, you know, you you need to start dressing like the people you see on stage. You know, you need to start emulating those people you see on stage. But the people on stage didn't look like me. You know, the people on stage, I couldn't relate to, they couldn't relate to me. You know, I wanted to be in their position one day, but they were, there were no people of color out on that stage. You know, they were white males that, you know, wore button down shirts and blah, blah, blah. I, you know, I was a, a young black man in Chicago. That's not how I dressed. That's not how I, I wanted to present myself but I still presented myself in a professional way, but she was trying to tell me that I need to change and assimilate in order to be successful, to get to that level. And that always stuck with me. And, um, and you know, but sometimes, you know, we, we bought, I bought into that sometimes that being in corporate America that, you know, you have to, you, you have to look this way. You have to say these things, you have to talk this way. And, Company, a lot of companies say they value diversity, but they really don't. They value diversity in a box, right? So you can be as diverse as you want as long as you stay in this box. Um, and uh, and so, you know, but I try to tell my boys they can do anything they want in life, dream big, and, you know, they can accomplish anything they want. Well, yeah, these are really powerful and refreshing words to hear. And as terrible as this is, maybe this will lead to change you know there was big change like you said in the 60s and it seems like in a lot of ways we kind of got complacent and like you were saying everybody says oh you know work hard everybody's equal now but the reality is, is that's not true for a lot of people so right. we still have to keep keep chipping away at this right absolutely yeah you're exactly right well i appreciate you dc uh let people know where they can find you well i'm on instagram at dc crenshaw facebook at dc crenshaw um I'm a publisher of FET Lifestyle Magazine, which is FET, F-E-T-E, Lifestyle Mag, M-A-G dot com. And my wife and I uh, own Little Diners Crew, which is a dining club for kids between the ages of four and 12, expanding their palates beyond mac and cheese and chicken fingers. So um, go to littledinerscrew.com. If you got kids that you're trying to expand their palates, introduce them to different foods from different cultures, um, you know, this is... Uh, a great opportunity for you to do that. I appreciate it, DC. Thanks for being on the podcast. We'll talk soon. Thanks, Rob. Appreciate it. All right.